difficult. That picture is a still from a video clip showing a police car driving over a dog in a South African township. Um, the dog was sleeping in the street, presumably it was warm, and the police car drove fairly slowly over the dog. It's created a huge outcry, but eight months after that incident, there's been no disciplinary action taken to date. The policeman has not been held responsible. There's no criminal prosecution. So these are the people who are largely responsible for enforcing the law, and I think you can see there's some real challenges with that. We also have long delays getting into the courts, which makes it very difficult to prosecute these type of matters. Then the National Prosecuting Authority, um, who are responsible for actually leading the prosecutions, has been very politicized recently. That picture in the background is a farm in a town called Potchefstroom, where a provincial minister who owned that farm left the animals for three weeks with no food and water. Uh, there were over 100 animals in that farm. Two-thirds of them died before the welfare people even got there, and the third that were there were survived by cannibalizing those that had already died. This happened in 2014. It would seem to be an open and shut welfare case. The National Prosecuting Authority has now declined to prosecute this case for lack of evidence. Fortunately, with that constitutional court judgment I spoke about earlier, uh, a civic society organization is taking it up, but it does indicate the type of problems we have getting these matters before the courts and getting the proper attention that they deserve. We have some cultural headwinds as well. Um, this is a picture of South Africans doing pretty much what they do best, which is standing around what we call a braai or a barbecue. You probably can't read on that guy's shirt, but what it says is Shisanyama, which means hot meat, and they're celebrating Shisanyama Day, which has become a bit of a cultural institution. We have a public holiday called Heritage Day, which is supposed to be a day for nation building, for people to get together and understand our common heritage. Unfortunately, that's being expressed now through, um, it's been hijacked by this braai process, and Obviously, eating meat is very entrenched from a cultural point of view. Um, we also have um, this con African concept called Ubuntu, which um, loosely speaking means I am because we are, or it reflects a humanity towards the others. Um, animal activists have been hopeful that that type of view would be extended to the environment and animals more generally. But what we're seeing is as people become more and more urbanized, we're seeing farmed animals being brought into the cities, and there are lots of practical problems such as roadside slaughter, end of lay hens being sold at, uh, live at meat markets. Uh, obviously, the male calves from dairy are being raised for slaughter in these circumstances. So there are some real practical problems um, with dealing with this. Afrikaans culture in South Africa is also very much linked to the idea of living off the land, um, hunting, and uh, those things are often tied up with the definition of being manly. And um, also as the new black middle class um, uh, move into the cities and start to uh, earn more, we're finding that uh, meat consumption has become a way of representing your financial success and demonstrating that um, uh, you've arrived. And so there are some real, really big cultural issues we're going to have to overcome in order to try and arrest the factory farming trend. We've had some of the similar problems that uh, we've heard expressed here in the, uh, in, in the US. We, uh, in 2017, there was an H5N8 uh, bird flu virus uh, that ran through all the uh, um, egg colonies in the Western Cape, the layer hens. That resulted in 2.7 million birds being killed in two and a half weeks. We also had a listeriosis outbreak. Listeriosis is a bacteria that's often found in processed meat. Um, over 1,500 people were affected and 200 people died. And quite tragically, uh, those were mainly children or people from low-income communities. So despite these two really newsworthy events that were covered extensively, there was no coverage at all. There was no discussion about the method of production, how our food is getting raised. So we really do have a long way to go in order to try and get these issues on the, uh, on the table. I'm just going to talk very briefly about the politics, come back to this question of land. You can see from these shirts of these people marching, if all of you can read it, it says land or death. You can see how emotive the question of owning land in South Africa is. Um, in addition to the very real practical problems that farmers face with a long drought, reduced soil fertility, and increased erosion, 
Uh, we also have problems of human rights abuses against farm workers, which our new legislation has failed to address properly. We have violent attacks on farmers, and we have illegal land invasions. So the political space surrounding agriculture remains controversial. It's probably the number one political issue at the moment. Um, and there is a really crying need for some restorative justice. A lot of people feel that the political transformation in South Africa hasn't been matched with an economic transformation, and apartheid still exists, even though it's not formalized in the economic environment, and land seems to be the focus of that debate at the moment. Government has to deal with this. It's their number one election priority. We have an election next year, and... Um, in my view, there's an opportunity here for us if we want to take on factory farming by riding in on the coattails of this political argument. The reason for that is in order to address the demographics of land ownership in South Africa, which is still really in the hands of white people substantially, the government's going to have to promote small-scale farming. There's just no ways that they're going to be able to transfer reasonable numbers of uh, those 35,000 farms to black farmers in the time it's going to take uh, uh, for, for this to be solved as a political problem. And so I believe there's opportunity for us to get the factory farming issue um, addressed through that methodology. Um, the volatility in the political situation might provide a channel for us to attack the mechanisms of factory farming. After all, what factory farming is showing in South Africa is um, exploitation of labor, environmental degradation, and concentration of economic power. And these are exactly the things that the political, um, our political leaders need to solve. We're going to have to be creative to make that work. So in summary, I just want to uh, wrap up by saying I think the existing legislation, despite being 55 years old, offers lots of opportunities for welfare improvements. Um, Litigation is currently not being employed substantially as a meaningful tool, and especially not in the context of farmed animals. We have some possible untested constitutional remedies that have come out of our new constitutional third generation rights and the NSPCA judgment, um, and we have this political opportunity maybe to take on um, factory farming through the land reform process. Here's one little piglet named Rosie, she's just been rescued from a factory farm. She's en route to a sanctuary. We have not one but two farmed animal sanctuaries within an hour's drive of my house in Cape Town. Um, looking at the work that people are doing on the ground, I take heart from this co commitment and, and hard work that people are doing to um, arrest and reverse factory farming throughout Southern Africa. People are working on Meat Free Mondays, anti-cage campaigns, consumer activism, education, corporate outreach, and the like. Not much has been done yet with the law, but that's why my two South African colleagues and I are here. There's lots of low-hanging legal fruit. It's time to get to work. Thanks for listening. We have time for questions. If anyone wants to ask a question, either of the microphones. Tony, I'm, I think I'm just going to ask you to think out loud on something. The, the NSPCA judgment is so f foreign, for lack of a better word, to, to our legal system where an individual, an individual or a nonprofit organization could bring a cruelty investigation. The things that we as animal rights activists think of as cruelty are not something that prosecutors typically um, think of as, as cruelty. And I, as I heard you talking, as a failure of my own imagination to think what the hell would we do if we were able to bring these kinds of cases in court and you say it's it's untested now I think even as an animal rights activist what would we say to the floodgates argument that everybody's going to bring these kind of cases it sounds like that's not happening in South Africa but how do you how do you envision that moving forward and not um, basically overwhelming not overwhelming the courts but just sort of opening the the doors may be too wide. Will it be the necessary versus unnecessary clause in the cruelty law? Or just sort of how's it going to work if you have thought through it? Uh, it's, it's on. Um, yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that question. And I think, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure what the Constitutional Court was thinking there other than perhaps giving us opportunity to, to have a go. 
Um, I think the legislation, the question of necessary or unnecessary, um, we've been doing a bit of work with, with confined pigs, and um, it seems that that's going to be a factual argument. Um, uh, we're expecting a lot of resistance from the industry saying it's necessary to do that in order to com supply food to the country, and we do have food insecurity, and, and so that's going to be a compelling argument. But I think if we're properly prepared, uh, both with alternatives, uh, we, we can overcome this hurdle of, of reasonableness and unnecessary. Our problem, I don't see the courts being overwhelmed. It's, it's difficult to get there. There are standing problems that I didn't really talk about. Um, there are funding problems for these type of cases. We wait a long time to get in front of the courts. So um, I think from a practical point of view, I don't expect that anything to be overwhelmed. I think we're just going to have to uh, be ambitious and, and creative and, uh, and, and take it as we go. And that's why we've looked first at pigs, because we felt that as a Farm spe farmed animal species, they are easier for people to empathize with, and, and the, the confined sows have a really difficult time. I, I don't know. I think we're going to have lots of setbacks. Uh, I think we're going to find judges in jurisdictions that don't support us. All the same problems we hear talk, speaking about here. But uh, we do have, you know, so the primacy of the Constitution in South Africa is something that is very well revered. You know, people talk about that all the time. And to have a judgment like that, I think, just opens the doors to all different types of thinking. So I'm not sure. You're going to have to follow what happens and, and see, see how it goes. Go ahead. Really appreciated both of your presentations. Um, I guess when I think about India and South Africa, I do think that there are still very strong religious uh, communities, obviously Hinduism in India and, and in South Africa, Christianity, indigenous faiths. Uh, are you observing, uh, and, and in both all these traditions, there are these strands of animal ethics and uh, care for animals. I realize that's not the dominant paradigm. Um, are you seeing any faith leaders uh, stand up and, and try to use their pulpits, so to speak, to, to try to protect animals? Yeah, it's an excellent question, and that's something that um, actually at Animal Equality we've, we've debated internally several times especially in the case of India that has a Hindu and a Buddhist tradition, mostly Hindu, um, and where uh, the concept of ahimsa or nonviolence is so ingrained in the culture, uh, we sometimes wonder about messages that would appeal to, to this concept of ahimsa and nonviolence. Um, we're still debating it, but we would find two counter arguments to that. The first one would be that it would isolate the Muslim community, um, and that is a community that we, of course, it's about 10% of the population in India, so that is a community that um, eventually, of course, we would want to reach to. Um, and the second uh, counter argument would be it's not very appealing to millennials, um, and our, our target audience uh, for our educational campaigns are mostly millennials. Uh, when I was in India two years ago, I sat down with a group of millennials to do like a um, a focus group, um, and I was asking them about their eating habits, and though they were very interested in veganism and vegetarianism, most of them ate meat. And when you ask them about, what about your parents and your family, they don't eat meat like Westerners, they eat meat about once a week or twice a week, mostly chicken. Um, and when, when I was asking them about their eat, the eating habits of their parents, and they were telling me that their parents were all vegetarian. Um, so there would be the two counter arguments, uh, the fact that it would, might isolate the Muslim population, and the fact that millennials don't send, tend to be as far as we have um, experienced as open to uh, that kind of argument. But we're currently, we've run a study, we're currently running another study, and, and I'd love to share if you have any thoughts about it. I'd love to get your feedback. Go ahead. I, think I have, you have a, oh. Oh, I have a question for Sharon, too. Sorry. Oh. Good. Oh. sorry. I have a question for Sharon, too. I may be incorrect, so correct me if I am. <laughs> but from what I understand is India decided that all animals have a constitutional right, including birds and fish, over the summer. And I wanted to know what you thought the impacts of that would be on the animal movement, if there's going to be a lot of pushback against it or if it's going to be helpful. Yeah, so the Prevent Cruelty to Animals Act is very broad. Um, so it mostly says that, I mean, it, it's very broad. So one of, it, the, one of the sections says that all, it's all Indians' duty to protect animals and to avoid the suffering of animals. Um, so with that in mind, um, one of the things that has happened recently, for example, is that the Animal Welfare Board of India, not recently, I think it was 2007, based on the Prevent Cruelty to Animals Act, said that battery cages in India were illegal. But then there is 
that hasn't been ratified by their, I don't know the word is ratified, but uh, by the Supreme Court. So there's a lot of questions, I would say, in, in limbo. It's, it's very difficult to know how that is going to be enforced because it's not specific enough. Um, it's very difficult to know if it's a recommendation or a directive. So I think that it would be very interesting to get like the current Prevent Cruelty to Animals Act and try to see how far we can go with um, uh, getting the Supreme Court of India to rat rat ratify, I'm sorry, I don't know the word, um, some of the things like, for example, ending battery cages because it is clearly causing suffering to animals. We have time for another question if anyone has another question. I have a quick question for Sharon then. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned that animal equality is done a lot of investigations mm -hmm. in, in different countries. Um, in the U.S., there's ag-ag laws that the industry has developed to try to combat that. Have you seen that in other countries? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm mostly going to speak about Europe because that's where I have more experience. Um, so um, Europe, Austria, there was a huge case against um, activists in 2011 who were doing um, investigations into all sorts of animal industries. Um, there was a huge backlash by the government. They spent six months in prison and they faced several years in prison. Um, fortunately, uh, the case was archived and there was no further consequences. Um, so there was definitely backlash there. Uh, there has been a lot of backlash in the UK, but not for factory farming investigations, mostly for investigations and work associated with vivisection. And there has been a lot of arrests and a lot of people have been in prison many years because of their work related with um, vivisection. And I myself in Spain was part of, um, I was victim of a criminal case because of the investigations that animal equality was doing into the fur industry. Uh, this put the fur industry under a lot of pressure in the country. And uh, basically the fur industry spoke with politicians and they spoke with a judge and they managed to build a case against um, 11 people, including myself and uh, our organization, to try to get us to stop doing investigations in the fur, into the fur industry. Um, we fought back by trying to gain as much public opinion and public support as possible, so showing the res doing more investigations and speaking with the media and showing the result of those investigations. And finally, uh, that judge had to leave the case and the, the new judge that get it archived it immediately. So I think that um, as long as the industry feels threatened, um, and when we think of Europe or Austria, we think of very progressive countries, and I remember a lot of Austrians were like, how can this happen in Austria? Uh, and, but the truth is that in, in my limited experience, every time that the industry feels threatened, they're going to, they're going to backlash against the animal movement. Okay, well, let's thank Sharon and Tony again for their time. And Now we're going to have concluding remarks by Joyce Tischler. I wait. I will. Have. So we conglomerated our teams here, huh? Thank you, Tony, Tony, and Sharon. And thank you all for coming to this year's conference uh, and for taking this all in. And I know it's a lot. Um, and I hope the panels have touched you in some way and that you'll take that knowledge and information and passion back with you to your hometowns and think about what you can do to help animals. We have some thank yous um, that we have to give and that's the platinum sponsor Brooks Institute for Animal Rights and Law Policy. Thank you very much. Without, without our sponsors, this conference would not have happened. as well as our gold sponsor, Chapman, Cubine, and Hussey, our silver sponsors, PCRM, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, good folks, and National Anti-Vivisection Society, also good folks. Bronze sponsors, Carolina Academic Press and the Wuxley Movement, and then Miyoko's, if anybody didn't get the cheese on, on Friday night, uh, I think you can get it via, via FedEx or something. Miyoko's Cheese, which has been keeping us uh, going for a long time in the Bay Area. Um, also, thank you to the Lewis and Clark Animal, uh, Animal Legal Defense Fund student chapter, all the Lewis and Clark students who helped with this. The Chicago Marriott came through, all right. Good food, good food. Thank you very much. And yeah, <laughs> to Chef Baba and the Banquets team and the PSAAV team, thank you folks in the back for what you've done. 
And I, I'd like to give one unscheduled thank you. Um, I don't, does anybody know Henry Spear, the great animal activist in the US? He died 20 years ago this year. Um, and we used to have these national uh, gatherings of the CEOs of the groups and everybody would stand up for two minutes and talk about what they were doing and why everybody else should be doing exactly what they were doing. That's no. typical on my... Well, the last few years of his life, Henry, who had really focused on Revlon and cosmetic industry and, and animal research, but all of a sudden he started showing up and saying in his, in his, his very thick New York accent, you people should be working on a farm to animals because largest number of animals, massive amounts of suffering. And I remember the first year sitting there saying, yeah, Henry, I should be working on what you're working on, right, yeah, go away. And then the second year, my reaction was much the same, yes, Henry, yeah, 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 sit down. And by the third year, something clicked, and I thought, you know what, maybe he's right. Farmed animals, massive numbers, massive suffering. So I'd like to dedicate this conference posthumously to Henry Speary, you bastard. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, you woke us up and it has become my passion and this conference is somewhat reflective of, of the passion that we all have for farmed animals. So thank you. Next year, Portland, we'll see you there, right? Thank you.